back. There's a picture of my cat. <laughs> there will be more cats. I promise you. Uh, so, hello. I'm Emily. Um, it's, it's great to be here. This is my first time at Agile Testing Days, um, and it's fantastic. Woohoo! Um, although, after those comments about London, I don't know. We shall see. So I'm an Agile coach, or sometimes I try not to say the word Agile too much. Uh, sometimes I call myself a digital consultant, various things, depending on who it is that I'm working with. And I've been working um, as an independent consultant for about the last three years, and mostly that's in government uh, in the UK. And before that, I spent a few years working as a permanent employee in government in the UK. And I... Um, worked in the bit of the UK government called Government Digital Service. And this was the bit that was, uh, has changed the way that the UK government do uh, deliver products and services to users, so makes it uh, much more iterative. We use agile tools and techniques, very user-focused, using kind of lean startup design thinking, bringing that all in and creating uh, services, products and services that users actually want to use. For government, really? Um, so I spend a lot of time, since, since I left Government Digital Service, I spent a lot of time working in departments that are looking to change the way that they do things. So I work often in transformation programs. <laughs> but, <laughs> and digital transformation. Um, so I'm often trying to change the way that people think, change the way that people approach things. And... Um, I also get to work with places that are not government departments, so I get quite an interesting breadth, so I get to see how different people tackle different problems, which gives me a unique view. It means that I'm not always down in the weeds. I can actually take a step back um, and look across how different people are doing different things. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you about is how I came to Agile in the first place. Um, so I like any good person working in the digital space, I went to art college for six years. Um, and when I left art college, I uh, had a master's in fine art, very useful qualification, I can assure you. Um, I worked in the arts for a little bit. And I, um, after I got kind of tired of getting paid peanuts, um, I also decided that I wanted to move back into an area that I really uh, loved, which was digital and internet. So I uh, joined a recruitment consultant, and they found me a job in a marketing agency. Anyone worked in marketing agency before? Just a few. You unlucky people. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that, of course. Um, so I worked in a marketing agency. It was an integrated marketing agency, so they did print. Um, and they built websites, and we, we built websites in .NET and ActionScript, um, and some, some in ASP as well, so we're going back a bit. This is much before people were using, long before people were using um, mobile phones to look at websites. And I thought, this is great, I've joined this company, we're doing digital stuff, that's fantastic. And there was quite a big design part, department, there were about 17 people there. Uh, they were doing print and they were doing digital. And I was a project manager, and there were four of us. And in this entire company, there were also four developers. So four developers, they were doing front end, they were doing back end, they were doing anything that touched code, four people in the entire organization. Um, but they and we weren't allowed to actually speak to any clients. We needed some people in between. So we had uh, 17 account managers. And... Uh, Lots of these account managers were, some of them were quite new, quite inexperienced. And they were very good at, uh, well, they were incentivized to sell stuff. So they were very good at selling stuff to clients that was, you know, not always possible to do, particularly in the kind of budgets that they were selling them for. So I made myself fairly unpopular by uh, spending a lot of time saying, no, no, we can't do that. And protecting the people doing the work from this stuff that was coming in that was impossible for them to do. Um, so after making myself unpopular for long enough, I decided that I didn't want to work there anymore. Um, and I moved to a software company, and I found Agile. I was like, this is amazing. You mean, actually, the people that are doing the work can talk to clients? 
We can actually collaborate on stuff. We don't have this kind of massive gap in between where people are being given requirements and given designs to follow. We can actually collaborate. So I thought this is amazing. This is great. Agile is fantastic. Um, so probably like many of you thought, this, this is Agile's perfect. It's come from waterfall ways of working. This is great. Um, and in 2001, a bunch of people got together and they created the Agile Manifesto, which is an alternative to document-driven heavyweight software development processes. So it's people that are trying lots of different things out, uh, lots of different lightweight ways of doing things, came together and wrote the Agile Manifesto. You've all read this, right? I'm just going to assume so. So it's 16 years on now, and what's changed? All right, hands up if you're working on an Agile team. Fantastic. So we must be doing something right. Um, I did some searches. Uh, I've got some numbers for you. Numbers is how we measure things, right? So I've got some numbers for you. Um, I searched for Agile on Amazon Books, and there are 4,872 results that are returned. So loads of resources. There's loads of blogs out there as well. We've got this covered. We know everything, right? As well as that, there are 486,963 certified Scrum Masters, as I checked this morning, um, according to uh, the, the Scrum Alliance directory. Any of you on that? Yeah, I'm on there. Um, that has gone up about 50,000 in the last six months. Um, so we're great. We've got lots of people that can do this. Fantastic. Um, and then I looked on LinkedIn. And there are uh, 2,565,526 uh, people who are returned if you search for Agile on LinkedIn. Great. So we're all doing it great. Every, it's all going perfectly. Um, so why only 7% of CIOs saying Agile has never failed them? This is from an uh, article called... The, the title of the article was More than half of CIOs have lost confidence in Agile IT projects. Um, and I'm always reminded of this. So this is the manifesto for half-assed agile software development. Um, and I'm going to read this to you. So we've heard about new ways of developing software through paying consultants and reading Gartner reports. Through this, we have been told to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And we have mandatory processes and tools to control how those individuals, we prefer the term resources, interact. Working software over comprehensive documentation, as long as that software is comprehensively documented. <laughs> Customer collaboration over contract negotiation, within the, strict bounds, within the boundaries of strict contracts, of course, and subject to rigorous change control. <laughs> and then finally, of course, responding to change over following a plan. Providing a detailed plan is in place to respond to change, and it's followed precisely. <laughs> That is, in theory, why the items on the left sound nice. We're an enterprise company, and there's no way we're letting go of the items on the right. Who, who experiences this? <laughs> Almost as many people who said they're on Agile teams. <laughs> Something is not working. Um, and there is no magic wand. So a lot of this stuff is hard. It seems easy because we can understand it. It's comprehensible. Managers like it because they think they're going to get stuff done faster. They think they're going to get stuff done cheaper. And they can, they, can get, they can get rid of people. But the real challenge is actually this is about approaches, and this is about culture. And this is what makes it difficult. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that are close to my heart when I'm, when I'm working with um, clients and working with kind of agile or iterative ways of working. First up is people. So uh, who here is in an organization with people in it? <laughs> this is for some of, my, uh, some of the people that I work with. Uh, so it's people, not resources. We are not interchangeable beings. We can't just push, push people around a spreadsheet. Uh, so people. Um, and there's a line on the Agile Manifesto that says individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And I want to tweak that very slightly. 
I prefer to say individuals and their interactions over processes and tools. We're not talking about just individuals, we're talking about the interactions between those individuals. And that's what makes a team. So we're not talking about superstars, um, although we might be talking about superheroes if we, anyone was at the party the other night. Of course. Um, it's about the team, and it's about how that team interacts with each other. Um, many organizations, although we talk about team a lot, we also treat people um, and reward them in a very individualistic way. And the, some of the most, some, the, some companies um, incentivize individual um, successes rather than team successes. And this can end up with people stabbing each other in the back and, jump, and treading on each other to get to the top. Um, so we had a saying quite a lot uh, when I was at GDS, the unit of delivery is the team. So this really is about the team and how the team interact with each other and why is the team so important. Um, well, this guy, if anyone's read this book by Alex Pentland called Social Physics, now he, is, he does a lot of studies about how people interact with each other and how that affects companies, teams, groups. Uh, he does a lot of things where he attaches... Um, electronic devices to, to people in a company, monitors who they email, um, to see how uh, communication happens within organizations. And one of the things that he found was that those organizations where people talk to each other more are more successful than organizations where people don't talk to each other. Sounds really obvious, but he's got the data to back it up. And he talks about the fact that human communities develop a collective intelligence that's greater than the members' individual intelligence. And there's some other research out there as well that says that you can't predict the intelligence of a, of a team based on the members in that team. It's actually different. It's, it's individual, and it's, um, there isn't a correlation between that. Um, and there are a number of reasons why that is. And some of those are to do with flow of ideas and social learning that build a team's collective intelligence. So as individuals, if we were to just act on our own, if we're completely in isolation, we don't have anyone else to interact with, everything that we know has to be based on the experiences that we personally have. If we're in a team of people, we suddenly have the ability to tap into other people's experiences. So we as a group have far more experiences and we can build on top of those experiences. That's what we call collaboration. So it's about building on top of each other's experiences. And being part of flow and social learning so allows for people to learn new behaviors without the risk of going out there and doing them on their own. So there's a, there's a great story, and I can't remember where I read it. So if anyone knows, not where I read it, because anyone else has seen it. Um, that would be great. And it's about UPS drivers. Um, so there was a period of time, and I don't know if it's still true, that UPS drivers would have to uh, go to lunch with other UPS drivers. So they would have to drive their um, lorries, you know, stop delivering stuff, drive their lorries to meet other UPS drivers. And what that meant was they were spending time talking to each other sharing tips, sharing advice, and actually growing their knowledge because they were sharing that knowledge with each other. And then often kind of swapping parcels as well and taking each other's stuff if it was an easier route for them. So flow of ideas uh, and social learning and building on top of experiences. Now, there's another thing here is that diversity makes better teams. Um, is diversity uh, and inclusion day to day? That's, that's, this was in here already, I promise. Um, so diversity, when I talk about diversity, it's about diversity of thought and diversity of experience. And there are lots of things and lots of factors that can impact um, th that diversity of thought and experience. Some of them are outward, um, some of them are inward. So the more diversity we have, the more experiences within a team, the more experiences that we have to draw upon. And when we don't have diversity, uh, we have homogeneity. Who can tell me what this is? Lemmings 2. <laughs> Did anyone say that? Anyone get that? Um, so uh, homogeneity is uh, when groups of people are the same, when everything is the same. So if everyone's the same, then, it's, then you have less, um, less experience to draw upon because everyone has the same experiences. Groupthink is a 
term coined in 1972, and it occurs when a group makes faulty decisions because group pressures lead to a deterioration of mental efficiency, reality testing, and moral judgment. Bad. So groupthink is when we all, when groups of people agree with each other because they don't want to, don't want to disagree with each other and don't want to create dissent. And homogeneous group, groups can be self-serving as well. So they believe the things that they do are more impactful. Or they believe that what they do is uh, where their success comes from and any negative behavior is actually from things outside of the group. So we don't want those. Those are bad. Um, and there's lots of research out there. So this is from a quote from a, an article called Why Diverse Teams Are Smarter. and says, working with people who are different from you may challenge your brain to overcome its stale ways of thinking and sharpen its performance. We need different ideas outside of ourselves um, to help us think better. And there's, um, there's a challenge, a thing just to, to watch out for. So uh, many of us might be familiar with Tuckman's model of group development, where a group will go through forming stages, storming, norming, and performing. And there's one thing that we should be wary of when teams spend a lot of time together and don't have any outward uh, influence from anywhere else, and that's this stage here, dorming. So <laughs> this is where groups of people spend too much time together and start to become, start to become homogeneous, even if they didn't start off that way. Um, so long-lived teams can, can have this challenge if they don't get a lot of outside thinking or if they think they're invincible or become self-serving. So we need to um, make sure that teams are looking outside themselves as well. So somebody may exist in a team which exists uh, potentially in something like a community of practice, an organization, an industry. So we should find times uh, to look outside and find different, different things to learn. I mean, you're all here because you're learning new things, and you'll take that back to your organizations and your teams, and you'll bring new ideas in, which will challenge um, what people were thinking before. So it's important to balance the need for team cohesion with the need for, need for dissenting opinions. Um, this is particularly true if we're building products for other people that aren't necessarily like us and create the chances for people to talk to other people. So uh, some people may do things like put coffee machines where people will go and randomly bump into people. This can be a great thing to do. So I also wanted to talk about this principle in the Agile Manifesto, which is build projects around motivated individuals. And it's all about um, support and trust. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a story about a company, and it's a very much a non-tech company. Um, but I think we can learn a lot from them. Are there any Brits here? Just a couple. Do you recognize this store? Um, so Timpson is a store that is on most UK high streets. They mend shoes and cut keys is mainly what they do. They also, you can get some watch straps in there as well, but maybe some lighters, engraves some things. But they mainly um, fix fix shoes and cut keys. So they've been around um, for about 150 years. They have 1,300 branches across the UK. And they have, a num they have Timps and they have a couple of other brands that they bought as well. And they don't spend any money on advertising, yet they made 134 million pounds in 2003. They also don't have any shareholders, which means they are, um, they don't, they're not accountable to anyone. But they, they made that decision to get to that point. And um, 20 years ago, when the current CEO, a guy called John Timpson, took it over, um, it was in a bad shape as a company. Uh, people weren't particularly motivated. The shops were looking a bit shabby. Um, not all the money was making it into the till. You know, it wasn't great. And he, was, he wanted to really turn it into a service company. And the type, he wanted the type of service that he expected when he interacted with service companies. Um, he didn't like this idea where uh, you might go into a place and all the tills are centrally controlled. And the people operating the tills don't, can't overwrite them. Um, so it kind of breaks down that relationship between the pe person serving you and the person being served. And so when he joined, it had a kind of traditional management structure. So you've got your customers at the bottom somewhere. Management are right at the top. They're the really important people. Not many of those, but they're, they're sending uh, orders down. And somewhere at the bottom, you get customers. 
Does that look familiar to some of you? Um, and he wanted to change that around. You know, the real point of value is here, between the employees working with the customers and the customers. So he wanted to shift that around. And he created something um, called upside-down management. And it's the best slide transition you've ever seen. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Six years at art college, remember. Um, uh, so he turned it upside down. He said, actually, the most important people are the customers. And the next most important people are the employees that are working with those customers. And that's where the value is. And everyone else in the organization is there to support that. It's kind of revolutionary. He's been doing, and he's been doing this for a while. So it took quite a while for this to embed, as change does take a while for it to embed. Um, and when he changed this round, there were quite a lot of rules that had been set by management. So he, he, he threw that all away, um, and uh, he, he put two rules in place. And those rules were, look the part and put the money in the till. The money in the till is quite important, obviously. A service company, that's where the money comes from. Um, and the second rule is you can do anything else to best serve customers. So that's it. And they can do anything else they think is a good idea. So uh, store managers can do, can do anything in their store that they think is a good idea. To put some extra weight to that second point, um, he added in a couple of other things here. The first one was you can spend up to £500 to settle a customer complaint without management authorization. So if you complain, your shoes, your keys, something isn't right, they can just spend money, they can fix it, they don't have to have somebody um, check with them. They're completely empowered to do that. And then the second one, which is one that I love, uh, charge whatever you like. The price list is a guide. So you could go into any Timpsons store in the UK, and if they felt like it, they could do, do your service for free. They don't have to charge you. Um, they're completely empowered to do that. They're completely trusted to do that. Um, and this, this created a real change in the organization. So it had gone from a place where you know, people didn't care that much. They're doing jobs that you know, some of us might think, oh, that sounds like a really boring job. And it's turned into an organization where people really love working there. They're really loyal to the organization because they're completely empowered and they can change things as they want to. So uh, John Timpson says the secret is to trust people who serve the customers to do it in the way that they want. Um, even to the point where Timpsons are quite well known uh, in the UK for hiring people that have recently left prison. Um, they also hire people that are on day release. So they actually have managers in their store that when they go home at night, they're going home to prison. Um, and they're completely trusted. And it works. <laughs> um, do you all feel that trusted? <laughs> um, I love their handbook as well, so they really care about their people. Every Timpson employee has their birthday off. Everyone should have their birthday off. No one should work on their birthday, is my opinion about everything. Um, and this is in the area manager's handbook. So they, they really care about their employees. They check in on them, they see how they're doing, and they ring them up the day before their birthday, wish them a happy birthday, and tell them, just you know, remind them to have the day off and tell them to have a good day. And they also do other things as well, so they will lend people money if they need it. They have holiday homes that they will lend to people. But they really care about their people, and they care about them as individuals, and they care about the way that they interact with other people too. So I think there's quite a lot to learn from Timpsons. So people, um, it's about people and their interactions. It is about teams. Uh, diversity makes things better. And if you don't have it in your team, seeking ways outside is, is the first step. Um, and teams need to be trusted. And if they are trusted, they are motivated. Um, so uh, I also wanted to talk to you about pragmatism. Uh, so one, one reason that um, I'm a little bit wary in some places that I go uh, to say that I'm an agile coach is that they've been quite burnt before by people that have come in and been fairly dogmatic about the way things need to be done. Um, so dogmatism, the opposite, is the tendency to lay down principles as undeniably true without consideration of, or, of evidence or the opinion of others. So going into a place and saying, you're all doing it wrong, stop, I'm going to do it my way, 
is not very helpful and doesn't work very well. Um, when I did my Scrum Master training many, many years ago, the trainer said to me that um, it's one of the teams that she worked on, if anyone tried to put anything into the sprint, mid-sprint, they would lie on the floor and scream. <laughs> I uh, just kind of stepped back a bit at that point. <laughs> um, so actually just saying things have to be one way um, is not so good. Uh, a lot of my world looks like this. <laughs> Anyone feel like the, the black cat? <laughs> I'm just going to leave this on and just, just go. Um, so this isn't good. We can't just drag, drag people along. It's not going to work. It's not going to stick. So I like to think uh, that we're uh, somewhere between um, pragmatism and aspiration. We kind of know where we want to go. We want to be where everything is awesome. We want to be that company like Timpsons where everyone feels trusted and motivated and engaged. Um, and it's more likely that we're just going to take a little step along the way. Small iterations, kind of being agile about this stuff and not forcing people along. And sometimes it feels like that some people just like the status quo. I love this slide, but I don't, a lot of people don't get it, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, maybe I should play some status quo. Um, but that's not always true. Sometimes it feels like that. They might be resisting change uh, for a number of reasons. And we need to be sensitive to these reasons. We can't just push it on people. So there are many reasons why people resist change, and I'm going to give you five of them. The five have the best um, gifts that go with them. Um, so the first one is uncertainty uh, can cause more stress than inevitable pain. So there was a study done by the Medical Research Council and University College London um, that looked into how, how uh, uncertainty affects, affected people's stress levels. So they hooked some people up to some, uh, some things that would electrocute them, and they had them play a video game. And in the video game, they lifted up rocks. And if they lifted up a rock that had a snake under it, they would get an electric shock. If they lifted up a rock that didn't have a snake under it, um, they wouldn't get an electric shock. Um, and so about 50% 50, 50 of the time they got an electric shock, 50% of the time they didn't. And this was quite stressful. It's quite a stressful situation. Um, so what they did is they, they wanted to see if that would change, if they changed the amount of times that people found snakes. So they shifted it from 50% of the time to 90% of the time. So 90% of the time people would get an electric shock. And what happened is their stress levels went down. Because there was less uncertainty, they knew that they were more likely to get an electric shock. Um, so this, this idea that inevitable pain, that this uncertainty causes more stress than inevitable pain, it's the, it's the program managers clinging on to Gantt charts. They know they're not going to work, but at least they know that's going to happen. Um, it's not so good. So we need to find ways around that. So getting into, uh, taking small steps to get into the habit of changing helps it gets easier. Those stress levels will go down the more we kind of make small changes. Um, corgis can't get downstairs. That's another thing. That's a, that's a key takeaway here. <laughs> so small steps get in the habit of changing. It gets easier. Uh, much, many of us do this in teams with uh, retrospectives, but it's useful for, to do that outside teams as well. So another reason why people resist change is that they've learned they're not allowed to change. Um, and there's a condition called learned helplessness, and it's something that I see in lots of large organizations where people have learned if they do things, if they step out of bounds, they, they kind of get in trouble, they're not allowed to do certain things, so they kind of give up. Um, and there was an experiment done, another experiment that involved scientists electrocuting living things. Um, so they, uh, it was with dogs. Sorry about this, dog lovers. Um, and they had these dogs in a box, with a floor that um, a bell rang and the, the floor was electrocuted, they got electric shock. And they wanted to see then if the dog would get used to this idea that a bell rang, the floor got electrocuted, um, and they, they opened up the box and gave them a chance to move away. 
So the, the bell rang, and what happened? They thought the dog would jump over this little wall and move away from the electric shock. But what actually happened is the dog just stayed there. They were just like, we know this is going to happen. We're just going to... We're just going to sit here and take it. Um, and there's lots of people that are like that in organizations. They've kind of learned it's just going to happen. They just sit back and take it. And they're not allowed, they feel like they're not allowed to change. So it's important to create a safe to experiment environment, um, an environment where people feel that it's OK if they do something and it doesn't work. And sometimes that can mean just actually saying, I've got your back. If it doesn't work, I'll sort it out, it's fine, I'll look after that. Um, and I've been into places where just literally saying it's okay um, suddenly gives people the permission to start trying new things. Um, the next reason is that change means new skills that they don't have. And this is particularly true if people have been in a role for a long time. <coughs> um, this new wave of stuff is coming and they don't know how to do it, but they also don't want to look stupid. And they might be in quite a senior position um, so they really don't want to look stupid. And they spent a long time getting to where they are. Um, so making it easy for people to learn what they need to know is something that you can do. Uh, having open sessions can be useful, so you're not necessarily saying, you don't know this thing. You're saying, that's just an open session. Why don't you come along and, and, and kind of evaluate it, see what it's about, and give people the chance to learn new skills without having to feel like they're, they're stupid or they don't know what they're doing. Uh, so the next reason is that they've been through so much change already. They're tired. I'm working with an organization at the moment that this is their third digital transformation attempt. No pressure on us. Um, they've been through this before and it hasn't worked, and they're just kind of tired, so they're not really trusting it. Um, it's important not to give too many messages. So you can, it, it's, being consistent helps with this, saying the same thing over and over again. Um, it can take six or seven times for people to hear things for the message to start getting through. So saying the same thing over and over again can be important, not changing things too rapidly. And then the fifth reason is telling people to change is not the same as them wanting to change. So uh, there's a great video. Um, which <coughs> the link will be on my slides, uh, by the behavioral science guys. Um, and what they wanted to do is see if they could see what would happen if they, they went up to, they got kids to go up to smokers and try and encourage them to stop smoking. So uh, they got these kids, went up to smokers and said, hey, you know, smoking is bad for you. What do you think they said? Up, yeah. <laughs> Swore at them, was that? <laughs> Yeah, I know, you know, who, does, who doesn't know that that smokes? Um, and they asked them, you know, where would you, would you like to know where you can get some help? What do you think they said? No. Nope. Didn't really help. Um, so they, they shifted this experiment round to see if they could move from this kind of idea of intrinsic motivation, someone telling someone what to do, to intrinsic mot motivation for somebody wanting to change. So they gave the kids um, some cigarettes, and they went up to some smokers, and <coughs> any smokers here? What would you say? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> so the kids said, well, why not? They said, well, you know, you won't be able to breathe. It's going to be really bad for you. Um, so it's going to cause you emphysema. It's like, they're kind of going, yeah, the smoking's really bad. And then they started saying things like, actually, well, I want to quit as well. That's not good. I don't, it's good for me either. Um, and when they, they ran this experiment in a uh, number of places, and uh, calls to the quit line went up 40% after they did this. So people started to understand, have an intrinsic motivation um, for themselves to change rather than someone just telling them. Um, so it's not about telling people what to do, it's about them owning what it is and owning the change. So don't, tell, uh, don't just tell people to change, work with them, help them change, understand what their uh, intrinsic motivations might be. Um, and actually, we, we don't all know all the answers as well. Sometimes other people know the answers, so helping them come up with them. 
Um, and then I just wanted to, uh, when talking about change, I just wanted to touch quickly on evolution or revolution. So um, we can do evolutionary change and we can do revolutionary change. Now the thing, um, the, the kind of difference there is evolutionary change is small changes over a period of time that builds up. Um, if you're, you could think of something a little bit more like Kanban, revolutionary change is everything changes. Just change everything all at once. We're just going to do a whole new way of doing something the, the day you come in tomorrow, the next day you come into work. And so it's useful to look at something like the satire change curve. So Virginia Satir was a family therapist, um, and she created this curve uh, when talking about people changing, people changing big things in their lives. And it can also be um, applied to organizations as well. So what happens when a really big change is introduced? An organization will go into chaos. And you may have had this in your teams as well. Say you uh, decide you want to do something big, and suddenly everyone's like, I don't really know what I do anymore. I don't know who I work with anymore. I don't know how things happen. And you might get this chaos, which, which leads into a dip in performance. So things kind of go backwards slightly for a bit. Until there's a transforming idea, things are kind of, people start understanding what they're doing, and you move towards this new status quo, which is, which is higher up than the last one. That's if you get through the chaos. Um, so if you are going to do any big change, you do need to understand that chaos is going to happen. Um, and, that's, and, and you kind of need to either work through it or not go through big change. So I would recommend avoiding chaos unless you need a revolution. And a revolution can be a good thing to do, um, but you need to know what that looks like and what that means. Um, so with pragmatism, uh, understand resistance to change, you know, empathize. People aren't just being awkward for the sake of it. Uh, don't create a revolution unless you need one. And balance aspiration and pragmatism. And it's worth remembering the goal isn't to do agile. Um, and I see lots of organizations trying to do this. They're just going to go, right, we're going to implement this framework here, and then we're going to do agile really well. The goal is actually to, to make great products and services and add real value to our customers and our users. Um, and then just finally, some books that are worth reading. I'll share the slides online so um, you can look at those, some things that I draw inspiration from um, and making smarter teams. Thank you. So, thanks so much. Stopped. Questions? No? Yeah, now it is. Hi. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Um, about the intrinsic motivation, you already said it's difficult, and I'm aware there's no general recipe that one could follow, but maybe you have one or two examples that you could share with us how you motivated people so that they are willing to, to follow the change? Um, I think it's, it's important, important to understand why you're trying to make a change. So it's not the, the outcome isn't necessarily the change. It's probably trying to deal with some problems that, you, that, that were had. So understanding what those problems are and helping people find, helping, working with people to help them find solutions to that. Probably, did, if you saw the popcorn flow yep. talk, um, there were some things early on in that uh, process which was identifying some problems and then teams and people coming up with options. So making them understand where the problem is. Yeah, and then, and then working with them to, to come up with ways of solutions for that. And you may find that, um, and, I, and I get this sometimes, sometimes you think, I just want to give them the answer. And actually their <laughs> no. answer you know, might, might be only part way towards the answer that you have in your mind, which, which might not be right anyway. But actually any, any small change towards where you want it you know, to making it better is, is a good thing. Okay, thank you. Okay. Whoop. Thank you. <laughs> great, great talk. Thank you for that. Um, I enjoyed that a lot. Um, a practical problem that I currently have with one of my colleagues is that he doesn't want to change because he is convinced that the way he actually did, and he is a specialist in his development branch and so on, is the way that is best. And um, it is very hard to actually argue against the um, 
the, the inside specialist opinion that he has, because I, for myself, would also need to get so deep into his um, domain subject to actually argue with him that I find that quite difficult. How do you recommend to solve that? Kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Kill him. <laughs> um, so very quickly, it may be, uh, the, there may be worth asking, first of all, yourself, why you want that person to change, what the impact they're having on other people. <laughs> um, and if it's because, and I'm making an assumption here because I don't know, if it's because the things they're doing are having an impact on other people, then talk about that. You don't need to talk about the specialist subject uh, necessarily. It's about, you know, it's about how you work together. More questions? Yeah. Hello. Um, uh, let me <laughs> let me shape my question in a pro provoca provoca provocatory uh, fashion. Um, you just said that the real goal is not the change in itself, and we can assume we agree. And you also mentioned the fact that delivering services or products mm -hmm. or delivering value end-to-end -end is the real goal. You also mentioned that people, some people, sometime, unfortunately, unlearn that they cannot learn anymore, okay? Mm -hmm. So they change, it's such a click that, and it happened to me once in a while that I meet people who are not willing to learn even when they are given the choice to choose the subject. They are funded with any budget. I got license to kill and I say, well, you can choose the subject and we can go on training on whatever we want. And they just say that, no, I'm not interested in learning anything else. If delivering value end to end, is it worth to recover that person? Uh, <laughs> if, they're in, if they're embedded in the organization. But, but I think you're also, I find that question uh, difficult to hear because it's, it's uh, I can give someone money, I can tell them they can do any, any training they want, but there might be something else that's stopping them. There might be cultural reasons. There, there are probably I'm sure, other I'm reasons. I'm sure it's cultural there. reason. I, I, I'm sure that... But still, uh, in, the, in the shoes of some manager who is willing to deliver with happiness, I understand, because managers must be understood too, I understand their own dilemma about getting, substituting the person rather than bringing that person into an, once again into an happiness status. Who, who I it? think that dilemma must be acknowledged at least. <laughs> Who, well, I think that's, it's something, it's about the, the turnaround as well. So um, was it Jez that was talking about Numi the other day? Um, that, uh, so it's not necessarily about the people, it could be about the environment and the environment that they're in. And so if you're, if you're kind of just giving up on people and bringing new people in all the time, you'll probably end up having the same situation. Um, so yes, invest, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Okay. Hi, Emily, just one question for you, please. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the enthusiasm to make a change like in GDS works for the initial phase. How do you make it enduring and how do you get that sustainability going through that change as it goes? That's a very difficult one, particularly when it comes to GDS, I think, because the uh, GDS went revolutionary um, and the ripples of that is, is still showing and the, the chaos is still showing. Um, I think the only way that you can create uh, sustainability is to is to probably in, embed some people that can help uh, bring other people along. Actually, care about sustain um, to care about uh, building capability um, and care. I think yeah, just care about bringing people along with you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I had another point, no, I can't remember. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's tough and it takes a lot of work, um, but you also, have to you also have to understand that it takes investment both in times, time and money to do it and people can't just change overnight from one thing to the other thing. Last question. 
So you talked about this idea that as a coach, agile mm -hmm. coach, you can't imply your ideas into the team. Mm -hmm. But what if you were in that team and you thought you knew better? Do you have any advice on what to do in that case? Uh, so um, uh, when I work with agile team leads or uh, delivery managers, scrum masters, whatever their name is in, in an organization. Um, I, think, I think part of that role, and any, anyone that is, has a responsibility for something, needs to know when to lead from the front and when to lead from behind. So I, th I don't think... Uh, I, I used to hear people that said, well, the team is self-organizing, so I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit back over here. <laughs> it's like, I'm not really sure what value you're adding there. Um, <laughs> bringing ideas into the team is... Uh, and bringing new um, ways of potentially approaching problems into the team is a good thing to do, but then um, letting them run with it. So a bit of knowing when to say, hey, maybe we can try this, to kind of stepping back and saying, okay, I'll support you in doing that. So not forcing things down, but having, having sometimes an equal say in, in what things people might try. Okay, thanks so much. Please don't go, we have an announcement to do. Uh, first. Uh Thanks so much. Thank you.